Hello everybody, you should hopefully be able to see me now and hopefully be able to hear me. Um, we're a little bit early, I've, uh, I've started the camera running a little bit early this time just so we can make sure we get everything set up. And everybody's here and can see me and hopefully can hear me okay. There's a few people already in the chat I can see, so. The messages in the chat. We always have about five or ten minutes at the beginning where I'm trying to make sure that everyone can hear me okay and see me okay. And the only way I can really do that is by um, putting messages in the chat that we have by the side of the webinar to see if anyone can see me. Gerard from the Netherlands. Hi, good to see you. Thanks for popping in. <laughs> way de way. Thank you very much. You can see me and hear me. That's good. Brian, hello. <laughs> Whereabouts are you, Brian, in the world? You can see me and hear me too, that's good. Jim Bob, hi. Jim Bob, can you see me and hear me okay? Maureen, you can see but not hear. Mm. Well, some people can hear me fine. So I suspect the problem with the sound is at your end. Um, try turning up the volume a little and see if that helps. Tony, hi. You can see me and hear me. That's great. Thank you. I take it VA is Vancouver. Catherine in Seattle. Hi. Nice to see you. <laughs> JF Pue says, hi, and thank you for doing this. You're more than welcome. I really enjoy doing these. And thank you for letting me know you can see and hear perfectly. That's good. Snowy Hamburg. You've got snow in Hamburg. Mm, that sounds very nice. We've just got very cold weather with no snow over here in London. Well, I'm just outside London, actually, in Epsom. Judy, hello, you. Uh, you're from Massachusetts. I've probably pronounced that wrong. It's one of those places I'm never sure how I'm supposed to pronounce. Molly's got no snow in Nova Scotia, but never mind, we've got a webinar on painting today, so hopefully that will, uh, that will make up for it. 10 a.m. in New Zealand, Liz. Wow, that's early. Uh, some people are saying they can't hear me, but some people are saying they, they can hear me. Um, it looks to me like it's working okay. I can see the signal coming through. Just 
typing another message in the chat for people who can't hear. You know, can hear. Okay, that's good. Artist form. Yes, I'm feeling much better. Thank you for asking. Um, I did have to uh, postpone this webinar. Um, I think I'd postponed it twice, actually. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for being patient with me while I've been suffering with the flu. Um, I thought it was better to wait until I was feeling at least a little bit better. <laughs> Judy in Maine. Hi, Judy. Looks like it's all it's going okay for you. You got any snow in Maine, Judy? What's the weather like where you are? Yeah, Jim Bob, someone will ask how they refresh the page, but we must accept that not everybody is uh, at the same level that we are of using technology. And um, one of the the wonderful thing I think really about us being able to do this over the internet is that anybody can come along. Um, and of course, for some people, it's uh, it's quite a new experience, and it's it's still a fairly new one for me as well. This is only, I think, the fifth webinar I've done, and uh, it still never ceases to amaze me how. I think we have about 320 odd people registered for the webinar today. I can be sitting here in my living room. The cat is over there as usual, just me and the cat, bandit. Um, and 320 people <laughs> from all over the world, which I think is wonderful. 50 degrees in Maine. You see, I have a problem because um, being in the UK, uh, I work in centigrade, so I have no idea what 50 degrees means. <laughs> I take it it's cold, though. <laughs> Maybe it's cold. If your video is, very, is looking very fuzzy, um, then if you roll over the screen, um, on the bottom right, there's a little cog. Uh, there's a few little icons, and the first of those is a little white cog. Um, and if you click on that, um, it will give you uh, options for... Um, the quality so if you expand the quality drop down and put it up to 720p if you can then it should be much clearer <laughs> 50 degrees is warm for this time of year is it? oh, it's cold here <laughs> very cold in there indeed okay well um, it does seem that, that most people can see me and can hear me okay um, I think the technology is actually working, as it usually does, thankfully. Um, so, uh, again, thanks for coming. Um, today, obviously, I'm going to be talking about edge handling, um, which I think is quite an important part of realist painting, uh, and something that um, often isn't given the attention it, it deserves, I think. So I've got a, a plan for something to try to do for you today, um, to try and demonstrate a little, if I can, um, uh, how important I think it is. Um, a few things have changed. If anyone has been to one of these webinars before, um, hopefully a few of you have. Um, a few things different. I always try and change things a little bit each week. Um, the camera angle is slightly different this time. The camera that I'm going to have on the easel is slightly closer, so hopefully you'll be able to see each brush stroke going down. Um, a new bit of technology I'm playing with today is this little mic. Um, because I noticed in the last webinar, um, I had the mic on my table next to my palette, and every time I put my brushes down on the table, I put them down right next to the mic, and there was loud clacking sounds, which was most annoying, I found when I was <laughs> watching the replay later. So I've got this little lapel mic now, which of course means I've got yet another connection to all the technology around me, so I'm, I'm, there's even more chance of me knocking something over whilst we're in the middle of things today. But let's see. Uh, well, let's see how we do. Other changes today? Uh, let me tell you first what I'm going to do for you. Um, you can see I've got a, a lemon back here. Um, so what I was going to do, actually, I don't know if you if you saw the blog post um, from yesterday. This is the time the cat's decided he wants to go out. I think this is going to be even more difficult while I'm actually hooked up to a mic. But here's the little study, um, try and get some light on it, that I painted for 
um, the blog post yesterday. So it's the same study done twice, just a cube and a sphere. The top one is done with all hard edges and the bottom one is done with a variety of edges, some softening. Um, so I was going to just repaint that, but I thought, well, I'll make it a little bit more interesting and I'll actually do a little study of something. So I've got this little lemon here. Um, so I'm gonna paint it twice. Um, uh, the top one of these, I've already roughed them out ready. So the top one of these I'm going to do um, with all hard edges and no variation in the edges at all. And the bottom one, I'm going to introduce some variation in edges. It's the first time I've tried to paint something twice at the same time in the middle of a webinar. So that's another change. Hopefully that will go all right and we'll, we'll see what happens um, as we go along. I'm looking at the cat's managed to get out himself. It's a very intelligent cat. He actually, he when he wants to be in in the middle of the night, he doesn't jump over the gate like our other cat, his big brother does and come in the cat flap. He taps on the letterbox and knocks on the door. Too bright for his own good, that one. Um, other changes today. Um, I'm working on a toned ground, whereas before I've just worked on canvas pad. Um, today, this is an ampersand um, gesso panel. It's not really gesso. I mean, it's, it's acrylic. It's an acrylic primed panel. Um, they're very nice panels. They're light, hardboard with quite a nice finish. Um, I just fancy doing something a little bit different today, working on a slightly nicer surface. Um, so that's slightly different. I've already toned this. Now, usually I would tone it with oil paint, um, but it was a bit of a last minute decision to use the panel today. So I've actually, I've just toned it with acrylic, um, just kind of scrubbed it on and then, and then wiped it off. Other changes today, if you've been on, if you were on the color webinar, um, you'll know that, uh, on that one, you, if you remember, I pre-mixed all of the, um, the colors that I was going to use for that one. Um, I haven't done that this time, so I'm going to be um, mixing the colors as I go. Uh, and uh, we'll just see how it works out. I think it should be fine. We'll see. But what I do have is my usual Munsell neutrals, which I always have across the top of my palette here. So here is black. Um, this is titanium white. values myself um, this is value six and I find it really helps you to keep a handle on where you are in the value range as you're working if you have them out and also for this one the background and the ground of the um, the subject is is gray and black um, so um, the neutrals are going to be perfect for that so I've got black here titanium white this is ivory black and then values one two three four five six seven eight I haven't got nine um, because I generally find you don't need it too much because titanium white is about nine and a half anyway. Um, over here I've got, um, these are all Michael Harding paints, um, which have a nice consistency. I think they're quite high pigment load. Um, cadmium uh, yellow, uh, cadmium orange, yellow ochre, um, burnt umber. Now I actually could paint the entire lemon just with these four colors, but I've got raw umber out as well. Um, partly because I used it for the drawing out bit and also because um, it might be useful anyway, so we'll see. And this has come up a couple of times in questions before where um, people, I think people often put out every color they've got on their palette before they start painting. I tend to put out just what I, I need. But of course, um, this is a very simple study of uh, really only uh, only one main local of the yellow. Um, over here, um, I've got uh, Marage Medium. Now the one I use is, there are lots of different versions of this out there. If you, if you don't like using any kind of solvents or anything like that, you, there are other things you can use like um, Neomegilp or Liquin or stuff like that, but I, I like this stuff. Um, Old Masters Marage, this is a well used tube which my good friend um, Linda from the US sent to me long time ago and I've been using it very sparingly because I don't know where I can get this in the in the uh, in the UK um, now I like it because um, for working on panels like this it um, it, it uh, for some of the stiffer paints like uh, the cadmium yellow I've got here is quite stiff um, it loosens it up a little it means I can add more medium in 
um, when I want to paint a little bit more thinly for the background and the shadows, and it gives it a kind of a, almost a translucent quality. But the lovely thing about Marage is that the painting that I do now will be dry tomorrow, and it will have a lovely even finish. Uh, so it's great for that. So if you if you um, if you do a lot of a la prima painting, then Marage is great for that. So the palette is slightly different this time. No premix. I'm going to have to do it on the fly. Unfortunately, what I don't have this week is uh, the palette cam. Um, because I've set up the lighting slightly different and there wasn't room for that um, this time, unfortunately. What I am, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to get, I don't know if anybody knows of uh, David Kassan, who is a brilliant, brilliant painter, a uh, brilliant artist. And he um, has designed this thing he calls the Parallel Palette, which he did as a Kickstarter campaign. Um, and you can just clag it. I think it, you stick it on a tripod and it goes next to your easel. And then the brilliant thing about it is it means you've got your palette at the same angle to the light as your working surface. So every color that you mix on your palette is going to look just the same when you put it down. Whereas normally, if you're holding a palette as you paint, there'll be a different amount of light falling on your palette than is falling on your working surface. So you can mix something that looks right to you down here, stick it on there, and it look completely different. So the other advantage, of course, is that it means when I have the other camera switched on, which is on the easel, if I pull it back a little bit, then you'll be able to see the palette as well. So hopefully that's going to be coming soon. Um, I'm going to try and set that up. Um, so just to recap quickly, what I'm going to do today is paint this little lemon here twice. Once all with hard edges and once with a variation in edges. And I'm going to do them both at the same time. Um, and the other camera, I'll turn the other camera on shortly. Um, and that will show you uh, the close up. Actually, I've, did, I've just remembered that I forgot to switch the batteries. Um, so if you'll just hang on for just a second, I'm going to. I'm not actually going to change the battery, but I'm going to go and get the, the battery for the camera. I'm going to go and get the other one ready. Here's that back. I'm going to get the other one ready just in case I'm, I need it halfway through. Okay, sorry, just a second. Hello, kitten. immediately I start knocking things over. Apologies if there was lots of interference there when I was putting that back on. Camera battery ready just in case this one runs out. Um, so far in every webinar I've done, the battery has run out at one point and I've had to change it. So. It's probably going to happen in the time. What I'm going to do now, all being well, um, is switch over to, how do you, oh, someone's just asking, how do you refresh? Um, F five E Pro ah. um, just trying to help so who's, who needs to refresh the screen. What, oh, a couple of questions already coming up in the chat here. Can you repeat what the medium is called? This is Old Masters Marage. Um, M-A-R-O-G-E-R. -E it's a mixture of, uh, what's in this again? It's, it's, it's leaded oil. Uh, so it's fast drying because it has lead in it. Um, and I think terps with uh, gum mastic in it. I once made some, and it's amazing that the house is still standing because uh, I was cooking it on the on the cooker, <laughs> which is a crazy, crazy thing to do. Um, don't ever do that at home. No, no, Jim Bob, be nice. Some people are more tech savvy than others. Um, way do way will it be recorded? Yes, it will. It's it's going to be it's going to be on YouTube, and so that would be fine. And they're they're always recorded these ones. I do them as Google Hangouts, so they'll it'll be available on YouTube. And after the webinar is over, I'll send you an email. Probably tomorrow morning, I'll send you an email with a link to the replay. Okay, so 
what I'm going to do now is, all being well, I'm going to switch over to the camera, um, which is on the easel, uh, and I'll start painting. Yes, here we go. Um, slightly strange camera angle in some ways, but it does mean that I've managed to get the camera quite close um, to the painting surface. Unfortunately, it's um, it's a static lens, so I, I can't zoom in with it. Um, but it means that you're going to see much closer um, what I'll be seeing as I paint. So again, if you've been uh, in one of these webinars before, um, you'll know that uh, what I generally do is um, follow a fairly uh, fairly systematic process where I paint. Uh, once I've roughed it out and got it to this basic stage, just roughed out the drawing, um, I paint the background first, then the ground, then the cast shadow, then the shadow side of the object, and then the light side of the object, and then go from there. Um, <clears throat> Manuel from Mexico. Hi, I think you might be the first person I've had from Mexico come to one of the webinars. Hi, Manuel. Um, Okay, so I'm going to get started now. So the first thing I'm going to do is get some paint into the background um, so I can kind of see where I'm going. Now, although um, the shadow box that I'm using here is made out of black foam core, it's not strictly black. Uh, it's a, it's a, a kind of a light gray. Uh, sorry, a, a lightish black, a very dark grey. So what I'm going to do to start with, I'm going to, if you can see the palette here, um, I'll pick up a bit of, this is black and that's value one and value two. I'm going to pick up a little bit of this, uh, value two here, mix with a bit of the marage. I don't want it to be too thin, but I also don't want to be clagging it on really thick because it's just the background, you know. Um, and I'll just paint that in. This is so such a nicer surface to work on than what I was using before, which is those canvas pads. I mean, the canvas pads are great because they're really cheap, and I still use them quite a lot just for studies, but it's not really that nice a surface to be working on, to be honest. Okay, Jim in Mims is saying my voice is, is cutting out. Could anyone let me know in the, in the chat? Um, if you're having the same problem and you're finding that my, my voice is is cutting out as I'm as I'm working, I can always switch to the other mic that I usually use. Anouk, hello. It's good to see you. I think you've been on one of these webinars before, haven't you? From Antwerp. Thank you very much for coming. Now, the reason that I generally paint in uh, at least some of the background like this first um, is so that when I come to paint the object, I can kind of paint into the background. Now, it's, there's, there's many ways of doing this. It's certainly, you don't have to do it this way but I find it works quite well. Now, over this side, um, there's a little more, it's a little darker, 
So I've gone down to value one here. I'm painting fairly thinly, um, I, just enough to cover. Um, because what I don't want to end up with is harder edges all the way around here, harder edges of paint, um, which will uh, make everything look rather flat and less realistic. What's the difference between, oh, uh, Azra, from Luton, hello, you're not very far away from me. Azra is asking, what's the difference between Marage and Liquin? The difference is what they're made out of. Um, Marage is made out of uh, black oil, which is oil which has been cooked with lead in it, um, and um, gum mastic dissolved in turpentine, and liquid, liquid is an alkyd medium. Um, so it hasn't got any of that horrible, disgusting stuff that's going to kill you like you know lead and and all that kind of stuff in it um it's a lot healthier to use i i, I sometimes wonder if i i should just try some of those other mediums you know and if it's just snobbishness that i i like to use marage i don't just like it because i like to pr pronounce french words when i'm painting you know although it does make it sound very clever <laughs> but um i've actually uh, funny enough i've just ordered some Neo Megilp, um, which I've never used before. Anouk can hear me fine. Thank you. Sounds like everyone can hear me fine. Looks like that's good. Thank you. Uh, yeah, if the connection is dropping out, that's probably your end. Um, so uh, the only thing you can really do is just to keep refreshing. Okay, so that stage one is complete for me, and that's just banging in the background. So the next thing I want to do is to put in the ground. Now, again, if you've been in the other webinars, especially if you were in uh, the value webinar, if you watched the value webinar and the um, and the and the color webinar, um, you'll have seen me use uh, my little color checker um, and uh, uh, my little. Um, acetate strips um, which I use to put a little dab of color on hold it against the color checker and then hold it across what it is that I'm painting to to judge the mix of the colors to see if I'm if I'm close um, I've already done quite a bit of that with this one and also I find to be honest the more you do this stuff the more you do that kind of color checking and the more you build your sensitivity the sensitivity of your eye to colour, the less you need to do it uh, after a while. Jim, I'm very glad you can hear me now. Good. So I know that this value is, is about right. What I don't know is why I started painting on the bottom one there instead of the top one. So I'm really at this point. I'm just putting stuff in to give myself context. Now that value back here is actually a little darker than that. So I'm going to bring that down a little. But you can see hopefully part of the reason that this can be a nice way to paint is to paint the things behind the object first so that you can kind of paint the object over them. Um, which means you can mess about with stuff in the background, which I'll show you very shortly, like the edges. <laughs> yes, stick stick with stick with liquid. It's much healthier. <laughs> it doesn't sound as good as Marage though. <laughs> okay, so this value back here is a little darker. So I'm 
this is the, the the nice thing for me about having my my values already out on my palette like this is I can pick them up, um, whichever ones I need very quickly and easily, and just put them in. Um, there are lots of arguments about whether painting with strings is good or not. What I generally tend to do, um, I guess my process is is sort of fluid, but generally what I do is I is I will have um, all of my neutrals out on the palette because they're extremely useful for knocking back the chroma of colors when you need to. Um, and then I'll put out just what other colors I need. Sometimes I'll pre-mix, but if I do do strings, I tend to do quite limited ones um, where I, I'll do a general, uh, if I'm painting an, an object like a lemon, say, or a pear or an apple or something, I'll have a general color for the lights, a general one for the shadow, and a general one for the half tone, and then mix in between them. I can see in this, this part of the ground, it gets quite a bit darker. As it goes back towards the background, it's, it's a cast shadow from the side of the shadow box actually there. Now already at this point, um, I'll start to to make some changes to these two studies because what I usually do in a little study like this is do some blending of the edges. So at this point, I've kind of I've got a lot of the context in. Um, and I can start to see uh, if I'm getting the values right or not, just for the bit I've done so far. Um, now this one, um, actually I think what I'll do for this one, I'll accentuate the edges a little, um, just to really bring out the difference between a hard and a, and a soft edge um, once we get towards the end of the study. So we'll have a nice, hard edge there pick up some ivory black straight ivory black and have a hard edge here bring the value down there a little too but in this one First thing I'm going to do is blend this here. Now the thing about blending is you need to make sure that you have enough paint on the surface of the painting to do it well because you run a real risk when you're blending of, of lifting paint off. And in fact, that, that's what you'll do. You, you will end up inevitably lifting some paint off. Um, and you can end up deadening the paint surface if you do that too much um, and also making the paint so thin that it, it kind of lo it loses its its impact so what I'm doing here is I'm making sure that I have enough paint on here that I can actually work with and there's a, there's a number of different ways of, of doing edges um, you can just keep on painting finer and finer gradations on them, if you like. Um, but what I tend to do is, is dry brush. Uh, but you need to be very careful when you do this because, as I was saying, it's very easy for you to, to pull off the paint. So I've put a fair amount of paint on this one here, more here than I have on this one. And what I have here is, is a mongoose filbert. Uh, dry brush, there's no paint on this at all. So as soon as I touch this um, to the panel, it's going to start lifting paint off. 
Um, but I wanted to just show you a quick way that you can do blending fairly easily. It's by, it's like a kind of a, a hatching, as if you were drawing, and then lightly just drag up across. And I'll do that kind of incrementally up here. And each time I each time I pull the brush across, I take off the paint. And it it does lift off paint so you don't want to do too much of this you kind of you have to be quite controlled in the way that you do it because if you overdo it you'll take too much paint off so for this one i mean you could spend forever on this and get them perfectly smooth and everything but i think that's fine um this is i've left a, with a pretty hard edge back here and this one i blended now i'm going to do the same back here so <clears throat> because I want this back, this back edge of the shadow box um, to recede, I'm going to put some, some values in that kind of intersperse between, so that one went everywhere, intersperse between the dark grey of the back and the lighter grey. So I make sure of the lighter grey of the ground. So I make sure I've got enough paint on there to blend with. You can obviously you can paint you can blend with paint on a brush. Um, but I just have found this to be such a useful method. Just kind of stroke it across like that and then drag. And I want to blend this one right back because that's already getting a little thin, so I've got to be careful there. With edges, um, I think a lot of it is down to personal preference. Um, whether you prefer softer or harder edges in your painting um, but it's the relationship between the edges that matters not not how it's it's like value it's not an absolute you can't say i'm going to paint this edge this soft because it's this bit of the painting it's strange i'm really itching to do that one as well but i must make myself leave it leave it and, and leave that one hard Oh, Judy's just asked, was the underpainting of the lemon dry? No, it's not. Um, the, the panel is toned, and the panel was toned uh, is dry. I just toned that with a critic earlier on today. Um, but the the underpainting, if you like, of the lemon, all I did was the was the outline, and then filled in the the shadow plane, and a little of the cast shadow with the raw umber, with a little marge medium, and. Um, I did that literally five minutes before <laughs> the webinar started. I did actually mean to do it earlier, but I was putting um, our eldest to bed and think he likes a song, you know, and a story. <laughs> so I ended up not doing it until just before the webinar. Um, okay, so I'm going to put in the cast shadow now. I'm not going into too much detail about how I'm choosing the values and stuff like that now. Um, the, I'll, I'll send out I'll send out links to the other webinars when I when I send out the link to the replay of this one. So if you did miss the other ones, um, you'd be able to you'd be able to to watch them, um, which would show you some of the ways that I uh, go about judging the values. One thing actually is probably worth pointing out is that I've been very careful with this one, as I, as I always am, 
to make sure that I've balanced the amount of light I have on my subject and the amount of light that I have on my working surface. So um, I have two lights. I have one over there, which is shining on the lemon, and then I have one over here, which is shining on my painting surface here, because I need to make sure, um, because I'm working a, a version of sight size, um, and I'm doing direct comparison for the colors and the values, um, between what I have here and what I have there. I need to make sure it's, it's especially important that you make sure you can hit the lights. So I had to make sure I've got a Munsell chip actually here, which will illustrate it, which is about the, uh, the color, the, the hue and the value of the lightest parts of the lemon. Um, so I made sure that uh, when I uh, get, when I mix the, the lightest yellow that I can do at the right chroma, and I put it down on here, it's, it's, it, I won't have any trouble matching what I've got there. I'll be able to get very close. Um, and I think uh, it's much more important to make sure that you have, you can hit the lights than it is the darks. Uh, and just as a general rule of thumb, there are lots of different ways that you can approach compressing value. Uh, I should do a webinar a bit more on that methods of compression for values one day. Um, but generally speaking, make sure you can you can hit the the lights at the right chroma um, if you're doing direct comparison like this. Yeah, someone said they wish they could see the palette. I know it's it's awkward. Um, I'm going to get a, I'm, for future webinars. I'm going to have a palette set up here so you can see what I'm doing. I'll have to learn how to use it, of course. Okay, I'm going to put in the cast shadow now. Okay, it says, yes, please do a webinar on value compression. It's one of my favorite subjects. I absolutely will do that for you. I find it endlessly fascinating, and I, I'm sure I'll be able to work paint for my entire life and still learn different ways, different um, aspects of, of value compression. Because basically, the problem is that the value range of our materials is much more limited than the value range that we see in nature. And although people will tell you that when you're painting a still life, you can hit, hit the, the range of values. I can only think that they haven't really checked all that carefully because frankly, you can't. If you have, uh, it depends on your subject, of course, but nine times out of 10, you won't be able to do it. So if you have a still life subject that has a white object in it and anything even remotely dark, uh, a dark object, you won't be able to hit the value range. Oh, I should have cleaned that brush a bit first. I'm just going to try and just neaten this up a little bit. Now this top one, of course, I'm going to leave as it is. The fairly hard edges. I'm not really going to do any more than, than that with it, I don't think. I'll, I'll, I will do a little bit of... It's, it's not modelling exactly, but... I'll, It's one of the things I was thinking about when I was putting this webinar together and deciding how I was going to do this is I don't want to load the dice too much by painting the hard edged one badly, you know, <laughs> and like when I come to model the form on the lemon, I'll try and do them uh, in a fairly similar way. I tend when I'm actually modeling form anyway, personally, I tend not to blend not much hardly at all. I'd rather do it. I think you, you, you kind of lose the vitality of the paint when you do that too much. But what I am going to do now in this bottom one is I'm going to handle the edges of this cast shadow. So I'm going to add more paint 
So I'll make sure that down here, I've got enough paint to be able to mess about with this, with these edges without lifting too much off. I'm going to get a smaller brush to do this with. A dry brush again. Again, this is a mongoose filbert. Uh, it's worn, I've, I've been using this one for blending for a very long time and it's kind of, it's got worn down after a while. Um, <laughs> I can't, I'm sorry, I can't move the lemon to the right because I'm working sight size, so if I move the lemon, it will completely throw out what, <laughs> what I'm painting, and I'll have to start again. It's just the camera angle. I'm sorry about that. Um, but I, I did it this way around this time because I wanted to get the camera close up um, on, the, on the studies themselves, um, so you could see in a bit more detail what I was doing, and unfortunately, that meant sacrificing being able to see as much of the subject. Um, but here we go, I'm going to do a little bit more of blending here now. An interesting thing you can do with this kind of hatching thing that I was talking about before, is you can ha do like bigger hatches, or smaller ones, and you can kind of gradually grade how much the edge softens. So on cast shadows, the further away the shadow gets from the object, the softer the edge. And you can, without too much trouble, you can kind of emulate that with this method by doing bigger hatches. Where you want the edge more soft and smaller ones. I'd say the, the one kind of what can be a disadvantage of doing it this way is that sometimes it will change the value quite a bit if you're not careful. So you might end up having to repaint the shadow a couple of times. Um, now the back edge of the cast shadow, the back edge of this shadow actually starts over here. So this sharper bit of shadow here I can't see. So the whole of the back edge of the shadow, the cast shadow, is softer than the front edge. So I'm going to try and... Now, all, all the time I'm doing this, I'm, I'm looking between... Yes, the value has come up a bit too much, so I need to bring it back down. I'm, I'm looking between... I'm squinting. I've got one eye closed. I'm squinting the other eye. To kind of... Sim and I'm looking at the subject and I'm looking at my painting to kind of simplify. and hopefully to get close, get closer that way. Now I don't think I want to be pulling that around anymore because I'm just going to end up pulling too much paint off. Um, but you can, you know, I mean, you. That's the great thing about oil paint is you. I could put more paint back in. I could work on that some more. Um, but hopefully you can see w at least one of the advantages now. Of painting the background and the cash shadow like this. So I can manipulate this edge without affecting anything on the lemon itself. But now that I've got to that point with it, I'm ready to start painting the lemon. So the first thing I'm going to do is to mix up and put in the shadow plane. Oh, Jim's asking what kind of lights do I use? I'll send out a, I'll send out a link. I always send out a link to the lights that I use in the uh, the photography lights, but I got better better bulbs for them with a higher CRI. Um, they're not particularly expensive. It's a photography lighting kit. I've got two of them with soft boxes, and each one has four bulbs um, for those daylight bulbs.
So what I'm doing right now is I'm mixing up the general shadow color from burnt umber and yellow, burnt umber and cadmium yellow. Which is here. So I've just got cadmium yellow, mostly uh, burnt umber, a little bit of cadmium yellow in there too. Adding a little bit of medium. And Jim's asked what pigments I use to make the value string. Um, for this one, I used, for, usually I use titanium white, ivory black, and burnt umber. Okay. You can see on this one where I've done the blending, there's a lot more of this paint has come into the, where the lemon is. So I'm just going to wipe a bit of that back. So not too much of that opaque gray gets into my shadow color. Preferably none if I can help it. The funny thing, I only noticed this the other day when I was I was um, watching back one of the webinars. I don't know if you've ever watched yourself on camera or if you've ever heard your own voice. It's a really strange experience. And you just think, I don't sound like that, do I? This must be somebody else. But I realized that I, I have this, I suppose it's like a concentration tick um, that I, I didn't know that I did. And I go, <laughs> and now I'm really paranoid about it because I've got this lapel mic so I keep thinking it's going to come across really loud on the audio but I guess I'll find out okay so I think I'm going to have to darken this cast shadow a little bit but that's the shadow planning now, I'm not really actually going to do uh, any blending and modeling at this stage I'm going to go straight in with the lights now the lighter parts of the lemon and for that I'm just going to use cadmium yellow and titanium white uh, interestingly I find I've painted quite a few lemons and never once used lemon yellow and I've got a lemon yellow I'll put a little bit of the marage in but a little bit a little bit less uh, and we'll generally paint a little bit thicker when I'm going into the lights.
It looks like a coconut. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose it does a bit. Hopefully it'll get a bit more laminified before too long. Now I find as I start to move back from the lightest parts of the lemon, I, I will. If, if you're interested in knowing, I, I add a little bit of cadmium orange so I don't lose too much chromo and um, yellow ochre. And I'm putting the paint in fairly thickly. And it's not really until I get a fair bit of the lemon painted in and, and all of that is, co is covered. That you can start to see how the values and the color are working. Am I using a bristle brush? This is actually this is um, a, a mongoose filbert. Mongoose, I believe, is now an endangered species, so you can't get these brushes anymore. At least they're not making them anymore, which is, of course, right and proper. Um, but this is Rosemary's, Rosemary's brush. I buy Rosemary's... These days I buy Rosemary's brushes. I got some recently, and I just think they're wonderful, really wonderful brushes. These ones are particularly have a particularly long long bristles. Anouk has to go to bed. I know how you feel, Anouk. <laughs> this is actually quite late for me. What are we up to now? We're just coming up to 10 o'clock. Usually, uh, actually, I should warn people, usually what happens with these webinars is I tend to, I chitter chatter for about half an hour at the start, then I paint for an hour or so. And then we have a, a question and answer session at the end um, when I stop painting entirely. And um, just answer questions. So if you do have any questions, I've actually got, I've found a, a way to get the chat up in front of me whilst I'm painting now. And I'm not sure if it's a good idea or not, because it means I keep looking at the chat and it's kind of um, distracting. Um, but if you do have a question and you want me to give it my full attention, then if you save it for the Q&A session at the end, that would probably be good. At this stage, I'm kind of, it's almost like a building up a mosaic in a way. I'm just trying to find 
the right colors and, and dab them in where they need to go. Another vote for rosemary brushes there. Yeah, they're absolutely brilliant. <clears throat> I thought the brushes I was using before were good, but I hadn't tried rosemaries. They really are something else. The feel of them is wonderful. Before that, I was using Cornelison's and Robison's brushes, which are nice, you know, they're, they are nice brushes. But they're really, they're not a patch on rosemaries. Okay, going into the half tones now. So I've got most of the of the shadow and most of the light in. It's kind of the half tone area is um again I'm I'm using the same basic colours, I'm just putting different mixes together. It's it's I've got cadmium yellow, cadmium orange and a bit more burnt umber. Again, I'm, I'm squinting a lot, one eye closed. trying to mostly I'm interested in trying to find the right value for each bit that I'm painting it's interesting actually painting a, a, the same study twice I kind of get two goes at everything maybe I should do this more No, when you kind of when you get to I've got quite a bit of paint on the panel here, but when you get to this stage, it can be tempting just to kind of I guess just to kind of start pulling the paint around that's on there and worry at it. But you always need to be loading up your brush before you put anything else on. Otherwise you end up worrying the surface of the paint too much, lifting too much paint off. And the, the depth of colour suffers, I think, and the, just the general feel of the painting. And just in, in uh, I realise, of course, I'm, not, I'm actually dealing with edges much at this point, but it's worth pointing out that what I'm trying to do is to keep um, a clear distinction between the shadow and the light planes and, and, uh, and not to lose that. Because it's 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 very easy 
to end up with something becoming the more you paint it the more you you try and judge the colors and figure out what it is you're seeing you end up with something that kind of it, it gets more and more uniform across the surface and doesn't work so well oh I'll have to have another look at that in a bit. Let's just try and get those high, high highlights in for the lightest values. So there'll still be some colour in it, but it'll be mostly titanium white I'll be putting on. There's only really a very small amount of medium in it. So although the painting is very blocky at the moment, it's beginning to have some impression of form. And I'm going to go into the shadow and I'm going to add the reflected light. So you've got to be a bit careful when you do this, I think. And the reason I say that is because you see it so often in paintings where the reflected light inside the shadow has just been punched up too, just too high. It's really easy to overdo it. <clears throat> and it, it really can destroy the form. I mean, the, the light that's reflecting up here, there's some bounce light coming up here, mostly from light which is coming down onto the surface here and then bouncing up into the shadow. And then there's a, just a hint back here, which must be coming from the back edge of the shadow box. But the shadow box is dark, so there's not very much. You just need to be really careful not to overdo that and make it too light. And in terms of the colour, because the ground is grey, the bounce light is fairly neutral in this setup. 
um, if, say it was a, a red cloth or something like that, or orange or something, then that would affect the hue of the reflected light. Oh, uh, the battery's starting to go. I thought this might happen. What I'm going to have to do is stop just for a second. And change the battery on the camera, which is really annoying. <laughs> I'm sorry. But it's much better than having it cut out halfway through. So I'll just sort that out now. It won't take me a second. Switch to the other camera for a minute while I sort that out. If you do have any questions at this point, now is probably quite a good time to ask them. And I'll try and kind of keep one eye on the chat whilst I'm changing the battery. Okay, so for anyone who's watching this on YouTube, um, it appears that the, the website has just gone down. So for people who are watching it on the website, they won't be able to see anything at all now. Um, I 
which is really horrendous. I'm just going to hopefully if I can get it to work I'm going to email out a link quickly to people. It does mean that the chat is, is effectively down now, unfortunately. Mm. Technology is always letting me down. As brilliant as it is. Unfortunately, things like this do happen every now and again. Anyone who is still watching it on YouTube or on Google Hangouts, that would be a second. I'm going to send an email to everybody with a link to the YouTube video. The actual broadcast is still going, it's still running okay. Um, so I, I guess I'll continue <coughs> for anyone who is watching it on YouTube. Uh, it means that we have no chat, unfortunately. Um, but I'll continue with the studies anyway. So at the moment, what I'm doing is still trying to um, get the, the values about right for the reflected light in the shadow. <coughs> And at the same time, I'm doing some, starting to refine a little bit by interspersing values in between to kind of, to start to, uh, hopefully to model the form a little better.
I was talking earlier on about um, how easy it is to overstate reflected light. I think I've actually just done it there <laughs> myself. But overall at this stage, uh, I'm reasonably happy. Um, with where things are, it's, it's mostly about really refining now. From here, I want to get back into having a closer look at edges again. For too long. I must admit, I've been slightly thrown by the website going down in the middle of this. It's really unfortunate. Which means that the, the Q&A that we were planning to have at the end now won't be able to go ahead. I guess I'll try and find a way uh, to get around that at some point, um, perhaps by emailed questions or something like that. <clears throat> but it's a shame because the Q&A is usually the most interesting part. So looking at the edges again, um, for the top study, there's a much there's a darker part of the of the of the shadow which comes down here on both lemons and up a little here. For the top one. I'll leave it as it is. But in the in the bottom study, I'll make sure I've got enough paint on there. And I'll get my little dry mongoose out again. And I'll blend it a little. Again, I've got plenty of paint on there. So I can afford to lose a little bit, but I do need to be careful that I don't lift too much off. But because this edge is, is down into the shadow, it's quite a good place for me to be doing a little softening, 
Just need to bring in, bring up the darkness of the, bring down the value of the cast shadow a little there. And on the top one too. This edge down here is ripe for softening because it's it's receding into shadow. And likewise, this back edge around here. I can soften a little. What I'll do for that is I'll take a color that's somewhere in between the two of the background value and the value of the of the shadow. I, I remember when you when you're blending, you want to always be adding paint. Otherwise you'll end up with, at least if you use this kind of dry, dry brush method, of smoothing out edges, you'll end up lifting too much paint off. Now when I'm doing this, I have a, a very light touch, really barely touching the surface. But already I think this the bottom study is starting to look like it has a, a little bit more depth. And I do need to bring up down the value of the cash shadow quite a bit across there, I think. Where I've lost it. With blending. It's funny, paintings often feel to me like, even little studies like this, when you start them, it's like jumping off the edge of a cliff and then gradually bit by bit, manage to pull them back together until they start to make some kind of sense towards the end. And it's really just a question of how long it takes to get them to a point where they start making some sense. I'm also going to bring up the value of the ground a little bit in front of the lemon there. Again, I'll keep a hard edge on this top study. Soften the bottom one a little. Kind of strange for me at this point because I don't actually know if anyone is still watching. But I'm going to assume that at least one person is still watching and then it's still worth me continuing on the study. So for this, the bottom one now, I'm going to do just some really, I've got quite a lot of paint on there. I've got plenty of paint on there. So I'm going to just do some very gentle pulling around of the paint. I really don't want to overdo this because I don't want to lift all that paint off. 
just to take out some of the soften some of the harder transitions a little bit very much like to continue further with this hopefully at this stage I've got it kind of far enough through to kind of give it an impression of give an idea of how the way the, the edges are handled can make a, a difference to the feeling of, of depth. Um, I think this edge back here, especially being um, blended so much, pushes this far back and seems to bring um, the lemon forward. And although uh, although that edge really is further back, It doesn't look like that when I look at it because when you focus on something, obviously you, you, it's the center of your focus and you see it much more clearly. So it's almost like you're trying to paint that back edge as if you're looking at the lemon. So even if you're looking at the back edge in the painting, it's still very much uh, softened and, and pushed back. Of course, what I could do if I really wanted to was do the kind of give a bit of a level glow around here. <laughs> Just by painting a bit of the, of the local. into the background. Uh, generally speaking, I tend not to do this kind of thing if I'm doing painting, but it's another w way that you can kind of handle the, the, there's a little bit of a glow coming off, off the lemon there, but the edge is still there. I'm destroying the edge a little bit at the back here to soften that bit and it kind of it intensifies I think it intensifies the feeling of, of light just a little in the painting doing that kind of thing um, and on a bigger full-size painting it can be really quite an effective thing to do but hopefully I've got to the, these little studies to at least a point now where you can see how using a, a greater variety of edges on the bottom one um, has given it uh, a bit more of a sen sense of depth and light and hopefully managed to make it look a little more real. Um, at this point, all I would really do is is just work into the studies more. If this was uh, to make a finished painting, um, refine them more, uh, but really, with with a just a simple study like this, I think I've kind of I've gone about as far as I need to go to hopefully to demonstrate. Firstly, what a difference edge handling can make, and secondly, 
um, a way that you can go about softening edges for yourself. Um, I hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Um, for anyone who's still watching on YouTube, um, the, the recording, I think, will still work. So at least I'll get to send that out to everyone. Um, so uh, apologies now for the website going down halfway through or about two thirds of the way through. Um, we'll perhaps uh, try and find a way if, if you do have any questions, <clears throat> um, particularly about edge handling uh, or what I've been doing in this in this little um, demonstration. We can perhaps do it by email or something like that. We'll we'll find a way to sort it out. Um, but thanks. Thanks very much for watching.